about Libra and cryptocurrencies, the freedom of speech mm -hmm. issues that we've talked about uh, today as well when it comes to politics and so much. But let's, let's start here. We spent some time together talking literally the morning that you were launching Libra. What did you think was going to happen then in terms of the expectation for how it would roll out and play out in the public? Um, well, almost, uh, almost as it actually happened, right? I, I, I knew this you was going to be You knew that there would be this hard. amount of pushback? Yes. Uh, and I think it was to be expected, and for several reasons. One is understanding the way that this is designed is not trivial. Uh, you need to invest a little bit of time to really look into the separation between the Libra Association, which we don't control anymore, uh, Calibra, the wallet that is a subsidiary of Facebook, Facebook itself, uh, and also the fact that uh, this was designed more uh, to operate as a payment system to enable people to have access to modern financial services and digital money, uh, not really you know, as a thing to take over the world and control. Do you think all, if you had you know, said on day one that this really is a payment system, a payment platform, mm -hmm. and not a new currency, and maybe this is just language here, mm -hmm that would have changed the dynamic with which we all have thought about it and the way politicians have? I, I think uh, it probably would have. Um, and in um, you know, thinking about what I would have done differently if uh, I could go back again, uh, I would have definitely emphasized the, the value of creating new infrastructure to move money around the world for the very people who need it the most. Uh, it's true that the the nature of talking about uh, a currency, even if it's a digital currency that uh, has no money creation whatsoever. Someone joked to me that actually a Baskin Robbins gift card uh, was actually you know, creating more new money than Libra, which is right because it's backed one for one with a reserve. Uh, but this notion of creating uh, a new digital currency certainly has uh, has uh, inspired a lot of people to, uh, to come and talk how about How much this. do you think the critique is about the currency itself, or the platform, if you will, and how much do you think it is about Facebook? And let me just read to you, this is the Financial Times op-ed. Facebook's hubris comes at a heavy cost for Libra. Digital transformation banking is welcome, but regulators are right to argue that Facebook has yet to make the case for its own e-bucks. Mm -hmm. Is this really about Facebook? Is that what's going on here? No, it, I mean, uh, you first, of all, for, first of all, it's not Facebook's e-bucks. Second of all, I think that, yes, for sure, the fact that this started at Facebook didn't make things easier, given you know, the, the times we're living in and, and the role that the company uh, has and, and in, in you know, all of the issues that uh, we've faced and that we're dealing with right now. Uh, but the way I think about it is almost as a responsibility that we have to innovate on behalf of the very people we serve because the status quo of the current financial system really doesn't work for so many people. And, uh, and it's a little bit, uh, if you allow me, it's a little bit like the telecoms industry pre-internet, where we were paying a dollar a minute for an international call, uh, and uh, suddenly the internet has enabled anyone with a $30 smartphone to make unlimited calls and video calls and text messages for free. Um, and the same has not happened with financial services, 1.7 right. billion people who are unbanked, about a billion uh, people who are underserved by financial services. And by the way, a key difference is actually that everyone, poor or rich, paid a dollar a minute for right. that call, whereas financial services, the poorer you are, the more you pay. The more aggressive it is. Right. So. so, but the question then is, could have you launched this and Facebook had been a part of it mm -hmm. and not the lead part of it? And that, would have that changed the dynamic? Maybe, but you know, I, sp I spent much more time thinking about how to address this going forward uh, rather than reliving the movie in my head uh, too many times. Uh, and I think, look, we have to invest the time. And when I say we here, it's not Facebook. It's really the Libra Association. We're one out of 21 members of it now and many more, many more to come. So how much power do you now have in this Libra Association? So we have uh, at the Council of Members, we uh, have 1 21th uh, uh, of the, the voting power. And uh, I was elected uh, on the board, which was a, a very democratic process. It took uh, three rounds of voting for the five board members to be elected when uh, we had that council uh, meeting, which was great to see. Uh, and so we have one out of five board seats, and we have uh, one out of 21 council seats. Um, 
You've now had a number of companies drop out, and we talked a little bit mm -hmm. uh, to Derek Kazushahi at Uber, who has actually stayed in, but I'm just looking at the list, Visa, MasterCard, Stripe, eBay, uh, and others. They received letters mm -hmm. um, from uh, a number of senators, including Sherrod Brown, and the letter said, if you take this on, you can expect a high level of scrutiny from regulators, not only on Libra-related activities, but on all payment activities. Mm -hmm. What did you think when you, when you saw that letter go out? That it was an interesting way to talk about innovation uh, addressed to companies that had actually the fortitude and the courage of looking uh, at a solution that could potentially disrupt parts of their businesses, but were still willing to take part in this innovation, which, by the way, they still want to be part of the innovation, I think, once the you think they're just regulatory you framework. Think that's what's happened here? I, I mean, look, you have to make a decision if you're running a company, right? And if you're running a company and you have this thing, which is high beta, for sure, this is a high-risk endeavor, uh, that you're backing, and you have uh, all, the, all this pressure mounting on your core business, you have to make a trade-off of whether you're going to take the risk full on or wait for the dust to settle and the regulatory framework to clarify to join later. And I think, you know, I probably would have made the same decision if I were in their shoes. How much do you think this is about the U.S. regulator and what's going on here um, versus Europe? Because I think when you first got into this, that mm -hmm. the worry wasn't actually about what might happen here, mm -hmm. but what actually might happen in Europe, given some of the concerns they had about Facebook there. Yeah, I think, look, I, I want to separate the very good constructive work that is happening uh, with regulators and central banks around the world, with the G7 working group, uh, with the Financial Stability Board that is going to take on the work of understanding how digital currencies and new payment systems should be regulated around the world. Uh, those conversations are very constructive. Uh, and then, you know, there, there are other conversations that are more on the lawmakers and political side of the house. And, um, you know, there uh, it's more complicated, but, you know, this comes uh, with the, the, the very nature of the endeavor and the fact that it started at Facebook. And so over time, I think that, you know, look, the Libra Association is ramping up. You know, there's a search committee that is looking for a leader. I'm definitely not going to be that person. Uh, and uh, we're going to have someone who's going to represent all of the members as one organization, uh, and that's going to be on the network side of the house. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on building uh, what I hope will be one of the best wallets of many wallets that will exist in, on top of right. this network. For, for those, and I think that that's when things right. will start also. So changing. Those, for those uninitiated, let's just talk a little about, about Libra as a currency, because I think the other piece of this is that U.S. regulators, and, and I've had conversations with the Treasury Secretary about this, I've seen conversations with President Trump about this, um, Jerome Powell, uh, so many others. You know, it's funny, Governments, the, one of the last monopolies that governments truly have is on their own currency. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, of letting that go, I think, is very, very hard. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if you are successful, five, ten years from now, whatever, whatever the timeline looks like, that you will supplant the U.S. dollar? No. That you will supplant <laughs> other money? No. Uh, look, first of all, I think it, there, there are several things that are really important to understand, and this is actually how this works, because I think that that will help frame why mm -hmm. the answer is really a firm no. So first of all, if you look at the current way that money moves cross-border, you have uh, hard-working families that are split across mm -hmm. two nations. You have one hard-working person on one side who actually goes with cash to a store they're being charged, on average, 7% to move money cross-border. This is $700 billion a year. And they're handed a little receipt. They take a photo of that receipt, send it over WhatsApp or Messenger to the other side of the world, to the rest of the family. Three days later and 7% less later, uh, people actually walk to a cash-out location, which is generally in a high-crime area, so this is actually a risky thing. They have to wait in line hours. Uh, and they take the money out. So the, the way that this will be improved with a network such as Libra is that you're going to actually be able to do that right into that same conversation that you sent that you know, photo of that paper right. receipt, potentially for free. But if you're banked on this side, you're going to get in and out of the Libra currency uh, 
for in a minute. So it's a settlement coin more than anything else when you actually experience it. So you're going to connect your debit card and you're going to go dollars just to Libra, got, Libra to dollars. And you're or going to Libra. Libra to whatever currency comes on the other side and it helps with making the transactions low cost, real time, and available to all kinds of different people who don't have access to electronic payments and digital money today. Okay, so your competitor, Jack, D Jack Dorsey, and not in the Twitter land, but now in Square land, was asked whether he would join Libra. Mm -hmm. His answer was, hell no. And he said, cryptocurrency wasn't necessary to make that thing work. Born out of a company's intention, not need. And that's not consistent with what I personally believe and what I want our company to stand for. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, look, we dis disagree on a number of things these days, it seems. But um, look, I think that the current system has a lot of issues. One is it's not interoperable. So um, I used to run PayPal a number of years ago. Yep. We bought Braintree and Venmo. Um, today, if you wanted to do a payment between Venmo and PayPal, I, I believe you still can't do that. If you want to do a, a, a payment between PayPal and Square Cash, you still can't do that. There's no interoperability. It's almost as if you couldn't send an email from Gmail to Yahoo Mail, right? There's no common infrastructure to move money around the world at a low cost uh, that is available to everyone that has a $30 smartphone. And so I think that you cannot actually make massive amounts of progress for the very people that we want to serve unless you change the core of the system that moves money around. And so I disagree that you can actually do very, you, you, that you can cut costs in a profound way and lower barriers of access for billions of people by leveraging the current system. Otherwise, it would have already been done. Let me ask you a different question. The day that you launched this, the value of Bitcoin, which I know is very different mm -hmm. um, than Libra, rocketed. Mm -hmm. And there was a view that if you could get uh, these wallets, these electronic wallets in the hands of uh, a billion people, all of a sudden it would change the dynamic for Bitcoin and all of these other cryptocurrencies. Um, what, do you make, what do you make of Bitcoin as, as, a, as, as a currency? Is that something you own? Is that something that you could see being like a Libra or never? So I don't think of Bitcoin as a currency. It's actually a, not a great medium of exchange because of its volatility. I see it as digital gold. So you can hold gold. Actually, it's a very popular thing to hold right now. Um, and you can ho hold Bitcoin, which actually is a good corollary digital version. Right. Uh, but it's, it's not a good medium of exchange because the same family we talked about earlier cannot afford a 10 or 20% drop in one day when they send money across borders. People don't use uh, a unit like, you know, digital currency of Bitcoin to pay for things uh, just because it's so volatile. So it serves a completely different purpose. Of course, having more people having access to digital currencies uh, will enable and give people more access to Bitcoin and other right. digital currencies. Let me ask you a different question. This relates to Bitcoin, because I was always surprised by the, the critique, actually, of Libra in that there's somebody to call, right? There's an association. Mm -hmm. You can get on the phone if there's a problem. I thought a regulator would you say, can you can be called what? to testify. They can call you to testify. Yeah. They can't call Satoshi Nakamoto to mm -hmm. testify. There's mm -hmm. nobody to call when it comes to Bitcoin. And so the thing I've always wondered is if Bitcoin ever reached some form of escape velocity, mm -hmm. and I don't even know what escape velocity means in this context, I would have thought that regulators would come and try to kill it very quickly. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? I don't know. I think that... Um, you know, it survived for now 11 years, um, and it has gone through a lot. And I think that the, the main reason that um, it has not been regulated into oblivion, if you will, uh, is really the fact that um, it is not perceived to be a medium of exchange. And as a result, if you look at it as a way to invest your money, uh, and uh, this is an investment class that is decorrelated right. from the rest of the market, then, you know, why, why feel threatened by that, right? And I, th I think it, it boils down to whether it's a really good medium of exchange that hundreds of millions, billions of people are going to use or not. So given that this currency is about trust, mm -hmm. let's talk about trust for a second sure. in the larger context of Facebook, because mm -hmm. I think that's what this is really all about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the cloud that hangs over this. And, and the thing that I'm trying to understand is, and it's really the conversation we're having with Valerie and so many other people today, this idea, and it specifically goes to disinformation, it goes to what happened to our election 
in 2016. It goes to what may or may not happen in the election of 2020. Speak to this idea, though. Jack Dorsey did say, look, I don't know how to police this stuff, so I'm just not going to take the money. On the other end of it, Mark Zuckerberg basically said, I don't know how to police this stuff either, so I'm not going to, but I'm very happy to take the money. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that argument? Well, first of all, it has nothing to do with, with the, the money. money. Well, yeah. I mean, it has let me ask you a different question. With the money. I accept that it doesn't have to do with the revenue, right? actual revenue. Mm -hmm. But what I do think it absolutely has to do with is the larger regulation of these institutions, which ultimately has to do with money. Well, I don't think so. So the way I think about it, and of course we've had a lot of these conversations uh, internally, uh, is that really Mark believes in this as a question of principle that political speech is actually good speech, that people should be able to see it for themselves, uh, and that if you don't have political ads on the platform, then uh, you have large corporations actually that can advertise all they want about issues, but then you can have activists um, you know, for instance, around environment, uh, talk about environmental issues and right. get reach and distribution. And so not having political ads, in, in my mind, shouldn't be an option because I think that a lot of groups that are well-intentioned, that need to reach a new audience. Well, what about need those that with, the bl with the blatant lying? Just well, but the straight, problem is, it's stuff that's just blatant. But we the, all know it's wrong, we know it's not right. So today on the broadcast- The idea of profiting off of that, it feels, shouldn't that be uncomfortable? I mean, of course it is, because it's More uncomfortable to have anyone lie and reach an audience. But, you know, this is also true in broadcast and in TV. Like, the ads for, you know, political ads on TV are not necessarily fact-checked. And actually, I think that you can't even do that, right? But I don't want to get in the weeds of it. All I've tried to say is that, yes, it's a big issue to find the right balance. And I agree with what Kevin Systrom said earlier, which is there's got to be a balance to be found. Uh, I think that political ads are good, uh, and I think that you know, fact-checking them uh, is a lot of responsibility for a private company to actually do that at the scale we operate at. Uh, but it, you know, I think that well, the but conversation isn't that the is issue? going on. Isn't that no. the issue? If you, if you no. can't police it because at the scale you're at, mm -hmm. accepting it doesn't necessarily make but it, sense. But it, how do you define, so let, okay. you know, let me give you an let's example. Do, let's, right? let's go. So, but I, again, I, I'm here to talk about Libra more than, more than this issue. But look, all around the world, there are people running campaigns, making you know, promises about yes. things, et cetera. It's really hard to fact check at that level. It's like, you know, and I'm not talking about our own US elections. I'm talking about all around the world. You have elections, you have groups that are claiming that a certain policy is going to be great for people. How do you get into the level of precision to say, okay, this promise actually not possible, not doable, as a result, it's a lie. It's, it's impossible for a private company to actually get in the middle of verifying those things but if I tell and you, getting if it right. I tell right, you that it's raining out right now and it's sunny out, yeah. isn't that a problem? Yeah, I mean, it is a problem, but you can see for yourself that it's sunny. Well, but that's the issue. They may not, you may not be able to know well, that. I, look, and the micro-targeting of it Right? Makes it very that, complicated. Yes, that's a whole other topic. I don't know if that's a whole other topic. So what do you think of the, the micro-targeting issue? I, look, let's... <laughs> there are lots of conversations that are taking place about that right now, and we'll see what happens there, but... Uh, okay, we're going to open up to questions. I have yeah. one other question for you, and it's, it's a banking payment question, or I'm going to put it in that context, mm -hmm. which is this. So last year, uh, Facebook had something on the order of a billion and a half fake accounts, and this goes to the whole fake trust yep. thing. Um, Fascinatingly, or interestingly, in the banking world, I know we have a lot of bankers from Wall Street here, there's something uh, on Wall Street called know your customer. Mm -hmm. It's a rule. It's like, in, it, it's, it's the whole business. You yeah. have to know who the customer is. You Absolutely. can't sign up mm -hmm. a fake account. It's just yeah. impossible. Mm -hmm. Don't you think Facebook would be better off having a know your customer policy and a, a, a way to verify each customer in the same way, frankly, and we're hearing it from, uh, from Brian Chesky earlier today mm -hmm. when it comes to Airbnb, this idea of verifying all of the people on the platform. Yeah, and look, I know it's hard given think, the scale. Yeah, real identity is very important. That's why we're doing it for, notably for political ads, actually. There's full identity verification, and we've done more on the political ad transparency than anyone else. Uh, on verifying now 2.8 billion people who use our services every month, 
Uh, that's going to take a lot of work from the Calibra standpoint, the wallets that right. will run on top of the Libra network. We will uh, identify with a government-issued ID uh, that you're going to be able to uh, present in front of your smartphone camera to authenticate yourself when you create a new account. We're definitely going to do that. So I think that you'll see over time uh, more uh, of that and more real identity verification. Uh, do you think we'll ever get to a point where the, that, that, that two plus billion, uh, billion number in terms of users I, I think are it's fully, going, fully verified? It's hard because there are a number of regions where people actually right. don't have the, the proper means to identify do you themselves. Know, do, you know, do you know a service called Nextdoor? You know about Nextdoor? Yeah, sure. So you know you can't even sign up for that service unless you can actually verify who you are. They'll send a postcard mm -hmm. to your house with a code on it if you actually don't have a credit card or some other yes. way to verify. Yeah, it's easy to do that if you're only targeting the US, but if you're targeting some uh, other parts of the world where people don't have uh, mailing addresses, right. uh, don't have identity papers, uh, and that we still want to serve because you know we offer services that are really essential for people, notably in, around communications. People will rely on WhatsApp, on Messenger to communicate and stay connected with the world for businesses, for business and, and family personal reasons. We can't cut access to right. service, you know, to all of these people, right? So it'll take time. Okay, let's open up for questions. Or we'll sneak a, a real quick one in. I know there's some fintech banker types in this room, We're in so New York. I got to make sure that we, we we get to them, if we could. Go ahead, right there in the front. Can you get him a microphone? You've been coming to DealBook for years, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Andrew. Baldas from BJD Holdings. I'm curious about your thoughts on the issue of Libra, as I see it, already a significant portion in terms of just the number of people and the technologies users. I'm talking about Tencent and its ability within mm -hmm. China uh, for people to transact. And the way it is getting going to get leveraged, like the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. across that region and Africa in reaching the unbanked, while we are conflating our political concerns with the evolution of a set of technology, mm -hmm. I worry that we are hamstringing ourselves in this race, uh, in some measures we actually represent transparency and the good, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on that because I think that's a central challenge that we are ignoring at our own cost and more so our journalists as well because of the immediacy of the politics of the moment that is more exciting. Thank you. I'll defend the journalists in a minute, but go ahead. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked the question because it's true that uh, we're on a, in a race right now for the next uh, financial network that will empower you know, lower cost transaction and enable more people to come on networks. And China has announced that they were launching their own blockchain with digital renminbi in partnership with you know, Tencent and Alipay and a number of other com uh, companies and banks. And, and, and this is very misunderstood. In other words, people think that the plan is actually a domestic plan for, for China, but it's actually much more ambitious. Uh, and the plan is definitely to tack that on to Belt and Road to uh, attack remittances aggressively. Uh, the same market we're planning to uh, try to address and, and, and resolve issues for. Uh, and I think that you know, the set of values that we aspire to are probably very different. Um, and it's, uh, it's a real threat. And, uh, and I'm glad you asked the question because it's true that I've been saying that a lot. Uh, but, uh, but I'm not sure people fully realize the real you know, dead heat race we're, we're in right now. Can we grab that mic and get it to Tim Wu real quick? Tim Wu of Columbia has been writing some fabulous columns in the New York Times recently about all of this and more. Tim. Yeah, thank you so much. So I wanted to ask a question you probably faced before about privacy and um, uh, Calibra. So, you know, Libra is some separation from, from, uh, from Facebook, but Calibra is not, or it's a subs subsidiary, and we'll be collecting an enormous amount of data. And, you know, that is uh, something a lot of people have been concerned about. I, you know, Facebook has a, a poor track record in, in how it handles data. Now, you've made a series of promises about how you will treat that data, but how can people believe those promises? I mean, I worked at the Federal Trade Commission when Facebook came in and promised us they would never share, allow third parties to share data, and then turned around and gave it all to Cambridge Analytica. So there is a, you know, this is a company with a, a terrible track record in how it, uh, 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 it takes care of people's data. So why should we think any different about Calibra, given the new promises? So 
if you don't mind me, first, we, we, don't, we didn't give data, data to Cambridge Analytica, right? They were using the platform the way, that they, the way that the API allowed them to do that, and then they misused the data. We, we but, did sue you, five, we did fine you $5 billion for what yes, you did but, about but this. But that was not only for this, it was a long-ranging issues, and I'm not suggesting that we didn't uh, have issues in the way that we managed this. I didn't mean to escape that, I was just addressing the way that you characterized us giving data to a company. Um, so, several things. First of all, the way that the Libra network is designed, it's designed to be competitive in nature. So you will have uh, hundreds of wallets that you'll be able to choose from, and they'll all be interoperable. So in other words, to benefit from the distribution that Calibra will have, uh, you can use any wallet, and it will be interoperable, and you'll be able to move your account from one wallet to another really easily. So that is, first of all, putting us in a place where we have to compete uh, with other wallets. And to compete with other wallets, we have to make strong commitments when it comes to privacy. Because to your point, I agree. We heard it loud and clear. People don't want financial and social data commingled. Uh, and what we've done is built very strong firewalls between Calibra and Facebook in such a way that if uh, you're on the Facebook side, uh, no one can have access to that data. Uh, and uh, what we're looking into now is whether we can have that audited in a really good way so that we can uh, actually ensure that there's a third parties uh, monitoring that. But I would say the biggest guarantee is actually the FTC uh, settlement uh, that we entered in, which, would, uh, base, which includes having uh, everyone certify that the data is not moving in certain ways, including all the way up to Mark, who personally has to certify. That, that this is not happening. And this is, of course, way broader than just for Calibra and payments. Uh, but I think that's a guarantee of transparency and accountability that now exists since the settlement happened that didn't exist in the past. And I think that the, the process will work well that way. I'm going to let you guys take that outside. I want to thank David Marcus for a fabulous conversation. Thank you, thank you so very much.